we're finishing up our Take Heart series soon. Um, but if you've been here, you've known that we are in the middle of a series called Take Heart. If you haven't been here, maybe those words still sound familiar to you. Um, but these series of messages are all about, I mean, taking heart. And what does that mean? It's a really churchy phrase um, that I think we still have a lot of need of in our lives that exist here uh, in this time, in this place. Um, and today we will be reading from Matthew 5. Uh, and <laughs> it's going to come at you like a shock, this first couple verses, but they are going to be uh, expounded on and, and talked over in this next little half hour here. And I'm really excited for this Sunday. So from Matthew 5 in the NIV version, um, verses 21 through 26. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. All right, we're going to pray. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty intense passage. Um, Lord, you know these words. You know... Um, our hearts. You know this church, Lord. Um, I pray that today we would endeavor to know you and to know what you want for us in those words and in that passage and in our hearts. Um, thank you for the ways that you open our eyes and open our hearts to what you have to say for us and to us, Lord. Thank you for your kindness and your goodness. Uh, we praise and worship you and we invite you here, Lord. Uh, in your holy name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Uh, now you know why I had someone Bible a few verses, right? I wanted someone else to be the airbag for you today. Uh, hey, I am Pastor Kevin. I'm the lead pastor here at Rock Vineyard. Great to be with you. Uh, you, can, you can see right now, they gave me my hands today. That means we're going to be having some fun. I'm not holding the mic, uh, and we're, we're going to see how this goes. But uh, I am so excited to be with you all today. Yes, we are in our series, Take Heart. Uh, and I know you guys have absolutely loved it, right? Come on, you guys have loved it, right? Like, this has been so good, right? Just like, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I love the Word of God. It's great. Uh, yeah, so uh, next week we wrap our series. Uh, it'll be on Father's Day uh, next week. Uh, but I have just uh, been going back into just... The, uh, the the words in red. You you hear that you hear that often in kind of church life, right? It's these red words. It's these words of Christ, and uh, that's where we are today in Matthew five. We're not really jumping anywhere else. Uh, I'll be referencing these verses, so go ahead and open your Bible app, or if you got your Bible with you, we're just going to stay right there in Matthew five uh, twenty one through twenty six. Uh, I don't know about you, but real life preaches to me all the time. All the time. I, get, I just get these stupid, like, inspirational moments, and I just have, like, all these notes in my phone of half thoughts uh, of these things. Like, oh, this would be a great sermon illustration. Uh, oh, like, I feel like God has spoke to me in this. And, and this was probably one of the dumbest, okay? Uh, one of the just most basic things ever. Uh, a guy was building our privacy fence. No, I was not the one doing it. You think that would have been something? No, of course I wouldn't do that. I'm, I'm not equipped, okay? But I was watching a guy build our privacy fence. The guy was working hard, okay? It's Kentucky humidity. This was two weeks ago. And I just thought, th this thought occurred to me, this idea of separation came to mind, because that's what a privacy fence does, right? It separates things, okay? We, we want maybe certain things not to be seen. We want maybe a little bit of, of privacy. And so I was thinking about our relationships with one another, with someone, where we also, we build fences all the time. 
We build fences all the time. Something didn't go our way. Maybe they said something we didn't like or, or, or just something happened that really rubbed us the wrong way. And maybe I feel distant now. Maybe I feel like something should have happened and it didn't happen. Maybe that's where I'm at. Maybe that's where you're at. So we build these fences. But of course, you don't build a fence all at once, right? But you do it plank by plank. This happens slowly. We separate ourselves from other people slowly but surely. And it starts in your heart first. It starts in here first. And I want you to write this down. Uh, just, just a short little statement, but it, it really captures, I think, the heart of what it is today. And it is long before something takes place in your life, it takes root in your heart. Long before you got hurt out here, long before they did the thing out here that really rubbed you the wrong way, yeah, something took root in your heart. Something happened here. And so I want to talk to you today about the nature of offense. And this plagues all of us. Man, doesn't it though? I think even this probably told your spouse or best friend, I got so offended. You won't believe what I saw on the internet. You know, like of all places especially. Or, or just someone in our life, right? And, and, and how, how if we don't deal with these offenses, these things left undealt with, we spiral. I don't know if you're like me, I spiral myself. Uh, and, and we just get down into this like uh, hole of despair and this prison. We kind of build ourselves this prison of offense. And we start thinking the craziest, wildest things about these people, okay? And so we can rationalize some of the most ridiculous thoughts about other people too. We, we, can, we can rationalize all these things and it's spurred on through offense. And so right now, I think I'm looking at some incredible, some loving people. I think you all are wonderful. But also I think we're all very easily offended. And I know, listen, big mirror, myself, okay? I preach myself all week in this. I, I, I think we're loving people, okay? By God's grace, we're loving people. And unfortunately, we are also very easily offended people. So welcome to church, okay? I'm so glad you're with us today. We are going to encourage you, but we got to humble ourselves before we go anywhere else, okay? Uh, and all of this includes myself. Uh, and again, I'm not here to beat anybody up at all, okay? Just here to be real. And so the title of today, if you're the note taker and if you're the one that's actually growing with God, that's what you're doing. Uh, the title of today is The Fence of Offense. If you got offended by that comment, hey, then now's maybe the time to take notes, okay? Offense of Offense. It's cute and it's cheesy and I don't care, all right? You're going to remember this every time you see a fence, okay? You're going to remember this. Um, and, and I want this to be remembered. And I want some things that we talk about today to be practiced in your life. Honestly, full transparency, I want these things to be practiced in my life. Uh, I'm with you, I'm for you, but I'm going to be real with you all along the way. Let's go back to those first uh, couple of verses there in Matthew 5. Uh, picking up verse 21, Jesus is, is, is speaking, okay? says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Jesus' reference here is the Old Testament. He's talking about, you know, God's covenant and God's people and, and that place um, and those specific rules for a specific set of people for a specific place and all that. So Jesus is saying, all that's true. You've heard it said, right? Verse 22, though, Jesus says, but I tell you, Jesus, why do you got to say this, man? Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says a brother, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. I don't know about you, but I've said much worse things than Raka in my life. I have said far worse things than you fool. Okay, God's working on me, all right? Uh, but I have said worse. And it says that you are in danger of the fire of hell. So what starts in the heart doesn't usually stay in the heart. What starts as a thought usually becomes a word. A word doesn't usually stay a word. It usually becomes an action as well. What starts in here flows out here. So when Jesus is talking about hell here, he's not talking about something abstract, He's not using a metaphor here. Jesus is making reference to something his Jewish audience would know well. It's something called Gehenna. Find your neighbor, say Gehenna. 
Gehenna. Come on, it's just fun to say. Come on, Gehenna. Gehenna. This was a literal place where humans were sacrificed, where babies were sacrificed to the false god Molech. So at this point in history, this was an abandoned practice. That was not happening at this point from what we know of. But it was still well known. And space where that took place was still there. People knew about it. Come a literal garden. But it was said that the fires of Gehenna never actually went out. That the fires continued. That they would continue to just smolder. That the fire of Gehenna would just continue to smolder. So Jesus is mentioning this place because anger in your heart and unresolved conflict in your relationships can make your heart a living hell. And I mean that in a, in, in, in a real sense. But there's something to be examined here about the progression of offenses in our lives. Have you noticed that we kind of live in a state of perpetual offense? Come on, you, come on, you can be real. You can open up, let your hair out down a little bit. It's all right. We're in church. You can be yourself, okay? We kind of live in this place. Perpetual offense. Everyone's offended by everything all the time. Maybe not. Not while you sleep, obviously. But maybe otherwise, right? I feel like sometimes I have to pray 30 minutes or I post something to social media. Okay, like, Lord, just show me the error. Show me where offense will be, will be taken here. How could I phrase this? No one could possibly be offended. Now, I've, I've put some other spicier things, and, and I, I, I think I've had some very loving people challenge me in that way. I'm not talking about that, okay? I think that's good and healthy. But it's the seemingly small stuff that really seem to, to kind of get at us sometime. Uh, a couple of years ago, I put on Facebook, just the, the happiest place on earth. Facebook, I, I go, posted something to the effect of, um, you know, it would be radical to, to love people the way Jesus loved people. And I had a guy not DM me, he, he commented, he says, he said, he said, how dare you use the past tense? Jesus didn't love me, he loves me. Don't you know he sits at the right hand of the Father? Don't you know he is eternal? Don't you know? Okay, okay, all right, that's fine, man. It, it is what it is. You, you wanted to be offended before you, I think you dropped into my comments, bro. You know? And, and listen, we got to laugh at ourselves sometimes. That, it's okay. We, we got to laugh at ourselves sometimes. But listen, we Christians, I don't know if you're a Christian today. Let me talk to the Christians for a sec. Listen, we are some of the most offended people on the planet, which is ironic since our entire faith revolves around someone who dropped every offense committed against him. Okay? Listen, God is working on me too. I'm going to keep saying that. I'm not preaching against you, okay? I'm for you. I'm with you. We're on this journey together, okay? But God is working in me as well. Uh, but I've heard a pastor uh, put it this way. He said, it's hard for you to remain joyful when you're so easily offended. And I think it's true. And, and we can uh, dive into other passages of the Bible when it comes to offense and how to deal with these things. But let's stick where we're going because I want to invite you on a journey with me. Uh, and not be so easily offended, or at least know what to do when offense comes, because it can make your life a living hell. Uh, things just spiral so fast, and we make something so small, all of a sudden, giant and gigantic. And I think Jesus is right, because it doesn't start with action. It doesn't start out here, but I believe it begins in the heart. I believe it begins in your heart. And so add, add to this, though. If that wasn't, that wasn't bad enough already, Add this, uh, add to this the agenda of our very real enemy. Okay, uh, there is a very real Satan, uh, and his his uh, his agenda is destruction. Uh, for uh, those taking notes, that's from John ten ten. Uh, and so, uh, while every good and perfect gift comes from above, the enemy's agenda is certainly destruction. If the agenda is destruction, then I think the strategy is division, because Jesus shares in Matthew twelve twenty five that a house divided against itself cannot stand. It cannot stand. And so, you know, you, you live in Kentucky long enough and, and you see all the, like, the little license plates where it's like a house divided, Louisville, and, and Kentucky, you know, and, and you kind of see those everywhere. And that's, uh, but, but it's true, a house divided against a stand. And I think it's true of, of many relationships, but I don't think it speaks as loudly or as boldly as it does in marriage. And so I, uh, I, I've asked a, a couple of friends of mine to, to help me for a moment. Uh, some uh, some newlywed friends of mine. I'm going to invite uh, Junior and Vanessa up here. Come on, come on, Junior and Vanessa. You all give them a round of applause really quick. Come on. Keep clapping. They're slow. Keep clapping. Come on. Come on. Hey, right, right up here. Right up here. Right up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. 
so good to be with you guys. Uh, so good to see you. Yeah, uh, Vanessa as well. Uh, so uh, my wife and I did uh, Junior Vanessa's premarital counseling, and we had a great time. That was awesome. And uh, they are newlyweds. Vanessa, how long have you been married? A week and a half. A week and a half. <laughs> They're 10 days in, okay? So we're going to pray for them. Uh, Peter, okay, this isn't the purpose. Uh, but it, it is interesting. It is interesting. That the enemy has an agenda, and it is destruction. And that strategy comes through division. Um, and so what God, here, act like you like each other. You, you can put your arm around her. It's okay. Uh, so what God has joined together, the enemy wants to separate, right? What God has brought together, the enemy wants to divide, right? Y'all are wondering why I'm standing on what I'm standing on. It's, it's for later, okay? Uh, it's fine. Uh, but what God has brought together... What was two become one, right? But the enemy wants to make the one the two, right? And so in, in, any, in any really uh, good relationship, but especially talking marriage here for a second, uh, you want to develop those healthy habits that draw you back together time and time again. You all stand here for just a second. Just look pretty, okay? Just look pretty for a moment, all right? And, and you know, it's, it's interesting. The Bible says that, that uh, marriage is also... The perfect picture of Christ and the church. Christ and his love for the church. But it's those small issues, right? That kind of begin. You just kind of wiggle in here. You know what I mean? It's just the small stuff that, that kind of like divide and move us and separate us. But, but that's why we fight for marriage. We fight for the church, right? We, we fight for unity. And, and that can be really, really difficult, right? Because we're not always, we're not always going to agree on every single thing. Can you believe that? Even our leadership team, we don't agree on every single thing. How leadership meeting, I think 50% was disagreement and 50% was we found resolution because that's what you do, right? And in a healthy way, you can do that. Um, and, and church is no different. It's all the small issues. It's the small stuff. Pastor didn't say hi to me on the way in. I knew he didn't like me, <laughs> right? Oh, our child care worker didn't give out, uh, I don't know, graham crackers today. They were supposed to give out graham crackers today. What's their problem? What's going on in their life? You know, it's always small stuff. They didn't shake my hand. They just said, what's up, and kept walking. You know, like, like what's going on with this? Listen, we have all these things working against us already as it is. We have also on top of that an enemy whose agenda is destruction, whose strategy is division, and a tactic. There are many tactics, but I think what we're going to talk about today, the tactic is offense. And so if these two can just get a little offended at each other, Right? Just some unresolved conflict, not a big deal. Just, just something that gets in between them that, that, they, that they're not really going to talk about. Why does he never do laundry? Why doesn't she ever tell me how she feels? You know, It's these small stuff so that, that we won't talk about, though. right? It's these small, little, seen, weird offenses. You laugh because it's true of you, too, right? And so it's, it's just really weird um, because the devil won't necessarily announce these sorts of things, but it's, it usually comes subtly. It usually comes when we're not really looking for it. But then it rears its ugly, its ugly head. I think that's why Jesus uses the imagery of a, of a plank. Later on in Matthew 7, I'm just going to reference it. Jesus talks about judgment. And um, I'm glad you're up here, guys. Okay, I'm talking about judgment. And I got a big board, okay? Okay. Um, uh, but in Matthew 7, Jesus talks about judging other people, right? And he says, you know, don't, don't be judging people for the specks in their eyes when you are walking around like this right here, okay? And so, and so uh, let's, let's get a little space between you two. And, and so, so, Junior, when, when there is offense in marriage, because it's going to come, it's not a matter of at Vanessa and saying, Vanessa... What is wrong with you? Why can't you do anything right? What, why don't you communicate with me? What's this? What's that? But it's about reflecting on the big, goofy, stupid-looking plank in your own eye, right? And then it's like, well, all he does is spend time with his boys. I know Saturdays are for the boys, but Sundays are for family, and I'm sick and tired of what he does all the time. It's, it's not about pointing out the specks in each other, but the plank in our own. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need you all to help me build something in just a bit. You guys go ahead and grab a seat. I'll bring you back up in just a minute. Uh, but, okay, give him a round of applause. I got him up here for a minute. You guys aren't done preaching, just so you know, okay? But it is. It's, just, it's this giant plank that we walk around with, 
and we judge other people like this, you know? Um, for our uh, volunteers who serve in Rock Kids, we do a, a pre-service for them. I get to preach to them because they're not in here with us uh, for, for church. So I get to preach to them. And uh, this morning we talked about the importance of how this is true of all people. Not just people that you know personally. But how many times, oh, so-and-so politician. You look at the specs in their eyes. Look at them. Hey, last I checked, they got a soul. Last I checked, that's someone loved by God. But do, do you know what he said? Do you know what he did and this and that? And she's going to do this and she's going to do... Come on, let's take a chill pill, okay? We still say that. Let's just, let's just chill. Can we chill for a sec? All these, all these like judgments, because the judgments come from a place of offense is really what it is. We just get so offended and so tightly wound and all built up. But listen, the closer their relationship, the greater the opportunity. Man, I wish I still had them up here. But the closer their relationship, the greater the opportunity. And especially in something like marriage, something as intimate as marriage, so the closer their relationship, the greater the opportunity for offense, yes, because no one hurts you like someone you love. But also the greater the opportunity for love because no one breathes life into you like someone that you love, right? The, the closer the relationship, the greater the opportunity. And so I've seen this happen with friends in my life. Um, you know, they allow these little things to add up and eventually they get to a place where there's no love, there's constant love. And then they ask themselves, you know, how did we get here? And so it's important to remember that it takes one person to forgive, but it takes two people to reconcile. And so you can say, well, you know, I don't want to have this awkward conversation with him. So I'm just going to let it go and let, and let God have it, and I'm going to forgive. I, I think it's, that's admirable. I think it doesn't quite get the whole job done, because it takes two people to reconcile. It takes two people to sit down and talk about these things. Now listen, I don't want to do a giant autopsy on, on someone uh, today, but, but I want to show us, how it only takes one offense to absolutely trash a relationship one at a time. Yeah, there are giant things like betrayals, infidelity, adultery, uh, all of that. But I'm not really talking about those big things as much as what Jesus is talking about, these small offenses that take root in our hearts. These smaller things. If you get something in your heart against your brother or sister and you nurse it and you rehearse it long enough, it will create a garbage dump of a, of a relationship that wants a garden of potential and love and I wanted our newlyweds up here because it's like, it's, it's, it's here that it is just so pivotal to get these healthy habits in early. Because some of us, listen, we come to church with these offenses. <gasps> Crazy, right? But we do. Let's continue what Jesus is saying. Verse 23, uh, Jesus says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Notice it says reconciled, don't forgive, right? First go and be reconciled, then come and offer your gift. But too many of us, we have all these offenses that are just really left unsettled and it has eaten us up on the inside. But on the outside... Praise God, brother. It's Sunday. It's the Lord's day. We're in the Lord's house. Praise God. Praise God, Pastor. It's, it's such a good day. We drive home. We, we lose the facade. We lose the mask, right? And, and almost real life hits again. It, or it's like today. We'll worship, right? We'll even raise a hand. Woo! I may, I may say amen, right? About the goodness of God. I'm, I'm going to sing about the goodness of God and the awfulness of my husband who made me late because he used the bathroom twice. He's a jerk, but I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. What? This shouldn't be different, but it is, right? We shouldn't live a different life inside these walls just because we're here, okay? Let's, let's try to be a little consistent. And so the enemy, let's talk about him again. The enemy worked hard to divide and destroy our unity because when it pertains to God and especially marriage, the two become one, but again, the devil wants to divide, so the one become two again. And it all starts with offense. Just little offenses. And God knows I need this message too, okay? When I consider our marriage, it is something my wife and I, we work very, very hard on. That does not mean we don't argue. That doesn't mean that we don't go back and forth. We just try to do it in a respectful, honoring, healthy way 
But we, listen, we are really good debaters, okay? <laughs> We've gotten really good. Um, and I would say, in our marriage, I think I'm, I'm responsible for maybe 10%, perhaps. She's, she's really taking it upon herself. She's literally the 90%. Uh, I, no one loves the Lord quite like my wife does. Uh, no one loves uh, me as much as, as uh, she and, and she's so respectful and honorable and, and all these things. She's, she's the best mama in the whole world. She works hard. She's, she's all those things. She is 90% of the happiness of marriage. I'm at 10, and I'm proud of my 10, okay? If the Lord continues to work, I could be at 11 next year, okay? You, you don't know, okay? I'm, hard. I'm proud of my 10. But if I get put in the wrong situation, I tell you, I get offended easily. If, I don't know, if I'm feeling insecure, I, I don't know what it is. I just, it's like the, I don't know, just something overtakes me. And I just, uh, I, it, give an opportunity, I'd snap just like Thanos sometimes. Like, like, I just get so offended so quickly, so, so easily. And, and I think you're like, I, I literally brought a Facebook comment to you from years ago. Why? Why would I do that? Something, right? Plenty of people have said so many nice things to me since then. I think different posts have gotten my likes and hearts into the thousands at this point. But what do I remember? What am I thinking of? Hey, let's stand on the stage with you. That's just silly, right? Uh, I, I'm just, I'm capable of, of getting offended so quickly, and I think you are too. We find the offense. Maybe we find that little bit of raka Jesus is talking about here. We find a little bit of raka, and we just blow it up in our minds. And so look how bad it can get. Verse 25, it says, uh, Jesus continues. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary. Uh, earlier, earlier it said your brother or sister. And now it's talking about your adversary. And I think it's really telling how our whole life we can have a brother or a sister. And we go through something really difficult. We go through some offenses that we haven't really worked through. We go through something, and it spirals. And now Jesus refers to an adversary. I don't think it's by accident. I, I think a lot of us have some familial difficulties to some degree. And some of us know this to be true. Maybe a literal brother or sister, mom, dad. Maybe a figurative brother, figurative sister, friend, whatever. They've been there for me for so long. And now in this season, they're an adversary. I read that like it was two different people, but I don't think it's an accident. It turns out that those closest to you turn into your enemy if you don't deal with offense. Jesus continues. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together. Do it while you're on the way to your court date. Your adversary, though, may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. And to think, all that started probably with a little raka. Just a little something. It all started with a small offense. And, and I was thinking this week about how to just be real with you, uh, how, to, how to live in my world just a little bit because I don't do that enough, obviously. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I used to play a lot of Pokemon Go. Um, you know, it's just this game. Used to. Uh, definitely don't anymore at all. Uh, not at all. Um, and, and when we lived in Michigan, this was just a couple of years ago. I don't know if you know this about, about this game. It was, it was a huge thing a few years ago. But you've got to be out walking these stupid little things. Or, if you're like me, you're driving slow, okay? Um... And, and I remember, it, we, we did church on Saturday nights back then, and I left church, and I think I had the boys with me. I think maybe we had just had our baby girl, and so Kels, I think, was at home, and it was just me and the boys. And leaving church, there are certain areas of town that are better for catching these stupid little things. So I drive over to that area of town on the way home. What's an extra 10, 20, 50 minutes? You know, whatever. And, but here's it, you got to drive slow. You can't be out here driving 30 miles per hour. But I was on my way, and there were a ton of red lights. And I thought, oh, I, I can keep it slow. I can keep it under 15 miles per hour. I'll be just fine. Because obviously I'm doing this with my boys in the back, you know. Just doing this. It's not going to go dark, okay? It's not going to go dark. And, and I'm coming up on what I think is a red light, but it turns green. And I'm like, oh, darn, i got to speed up, 
you know? And this guy comes out of nowhere. No car accident, by the way. But he comes out of nowhere. And he comes up behind me, and he swerves, he honks, he does this whole big thing, and he shakes the fist. He doesn't tell me I'm number one, thankfully, but he shakes his fist. And, and, and where, where do we end up? Where, where do we end up? We end up at the same light. And it's a warm summer night. I got my windows down. He, his windows are up. So I say, hey, put your window down. I want to talk to you for a moment. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. And he puts his, windows, he puts his window down. And he's irate. And I just want to have a conversation. I'm not going to tell him exactly what I was doing, but I was, I was coasting to a red light, okay? Not a big deal. And he's like, what are you doing out here? Are you high? You're out here driving crazy. And I said, bro, just chill out a little bit. It's fine. It's, it's been a long day. I'm just out here with my kids, you know? I, I'm not telling him what I'm doing. I'm just coasting to a red light. Not a big deal. And he's like, I've just had a long day and blah, blah, blah. I said, man, I get that too. All this happening, very weird, right? But he's still, he's very angry. And I don't know why I said it. I just said, man, I get out of left church. And then I thought, shoot, why did I say that? He said, church? I said, I've really done it now. So then I don't know why I said this. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm the pastor of the church. The church sticker on the back of the car didn't give it away. But I said, I'm a pastor of the church. He goes, you're a pastor. His demeanor changed. Well, God bless you, brother. We're all just out here trying to live our lives for the Lord. You know, you have a good night. And he puts his window up immediately, you know. Just stupid, right? Light turns green and goes on. And, and I'm like, I think I'm done with Pokemon Go for tonight. And my uh, well, now six-year-old, I think it was four at the time, he says, Daddy, would you go to jail for yelling at someone? I said, no. Don't be ridiculous. But, you know, I just... Like, oh, that was the weekend I was preaching and I was talking about testimonies, how important it is, and all this stuff. And, and here I am, kind of preaching with my life to my kid. You can be one thing on stage and another when you're driving. Curse the guy. I didn't rock of this guy. I wanted to. But it's just interesting how something so small just blows up so quick. Have you ever done that? It was a small thing, right? 40 seconds later, you're like, what just happened? How did this thing just blow up in my face? It started with a little rocka, but it blew up. And here's the point of that story. Because when we are in situations like that, and it's the beginning of something seemingly small, we're not thinking of how it could end up. We're not thinking of how this could end up in a court date. We're not thinking about how we're going to sit with an attorney and go through these things. No one's thinking about that. No one is thinking about divorce the day they get married. You're not thinking about that. Those are not things you're thinking about. When you first meet someone, I'm friends, and you're like, man, they're really going to hurt me next month. It's going to be great. You're not thinking of that. And so a part of human relationships, let's add to that our enemy's agenda, of destruction, his strategy of division, and the tactic of offense. And so uh, Junior Vanessa, I told you I wasn't done with you. Come on, come on. I'm giving you some exercise today. Come on, come on back up. Uh, I'm going to move this out of the way. You all come up behind this rock here. Come on up here. Um, see, here's the thing. You don't have to be to grasp the significance of this, okay? Um, and I don't, uh, different pastors have had different fences on stage before, and so I don't want to act like this is my idea. Powerful illustration for us, and it's something that we need to take hold of. We need to take heart. Um, because what are you going to do, Vanessa? Vanessa, you represent everyone in this church today, okay? Here you go. You're welcome. Junior, you also represent people in this church. Here, I'll give you three. You're tender. So, what are we going to do when offenses come? Uh, not a matter of if, but what are we going to do when these offenses come to us? How are we going to respond? Because, listen, so many offenses, they come by things that we say. We think about it. And we say, well, I wasn't, I wasn't a part of that group. That really hurt my feelings. What's going on? I don't like how they talked to me. What was with that tone? I don't know. I'm sure it was nothing. I don't really want to talk to him about it. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know. 
I'm just nervous in conflict. I don't want to talk about it. So I'm just going to dig this nice and deep. And you know, I can still have a relationship with, with you just fine. I can still see you just fine. Not a big deal. I just see it most of the time. But it's okay. I, I can still have a relationship with you, and we're okay. It's, 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 not a, it's not a big deal. But we need to have tough conversations. We, we, we need to, as Jesus calls, make peace and not try to keep it. Uh, I, I think of one of the first times I, I, I wouldn't say I had a disagreement, but just had a little conflict, just a little thing. I'll get to you in a minute. Say pretty. But our treasurer, Nick, after uh, one of our leadership meetings, I, I don't know what I said exactly in the meeting, um, but it didn't sit right with him. Did Nick take off running and start a group text about how awful I was? <laughs> Did he vent to five people when really we all know that's just gossip? No. Did, did he go to his wife? I don't know. I feel like it's a safe place. But did he go to his wife and complain about how awful Pastor Kevin is? He's awful. He's all these things. Not the... No, an hour later, he gave me a call. An hour later, he called me. So I think we've got some wires crossed. Can we talk about this? Did I spiral? No. Did I begin thinking, I've got to remove him as treasurer? He's going to try to take the church. He's going to do all these things from me. Like, No. I knew who he was, and he loves me. He has my back. And he's going to tell me hard things, because that's what friends do. Proverbs 27, it says, But faithful are the wounds from a friend. It's good for you to be wounded by a friend. When done in love, but they approach you and say, We are not on the same page. There is something here. There is an offense that could potentially be placed, and we need to deal with this right now. And I think too often we say these little things when someone says something that causes us offense. Instead of, instead of digging in to love, instead of digging into grace, instead of digging into humility, we dig a hole. We begin constructing offense. We begin to build something. And so for our lovely couple up here, Junior, I'm going to steal one of yours. Um, sometimes it's unmet expectations, right? Because maybe in Vanessa's house, birthdays were a big, big deal. And maybe mom and dad always like made you pancakes in the morning and, hey, happy birthday, Vanessa. We love you, streamers, the whole thing. Um, Junior doesn't know that. There's some unmet expectation. So on your birthday, Junior gets up and he's excited for dinner tonight. And that's what he's thinking. I can't wait to give her this jewelry. I can't wait. All Vanessa knows is that Junior woke up at 5 a.m. because he works really hard, and he didn't kiss me goodbye. He didn't even tell me happy birthday. He didn't make me any pancakes. And I'm just a little upset about it. And throughout the day, I go back to it because I'm nursing it, and I'm rehearsing it, and maybe I reach out to a friend of mine. Can you believe Junior? Can you believe what he did? And maybe you go to a bad friend. Maybe you go to a bad friend, and they say, yeah, he's awful, isn't he? He's just the worst. And they don't have your marriage in mind first, right? That's what happens with unmet expectations. Um, hey, I'm going to let you grab these other ones over here. Um, so I'm doing a, heavy, a lot of heavy lifting. I, I'm, you know. But maybe, maybe uh, for, for Vanessa, though, Junior's the life of the party. And, and he's just an electric personality. He loves just being around people. He shows up to the party. The party begins. And Vanessa, listen, what you marry someone for and you love about them initially can drive you crazy, right? Uh, an old country pastor said, uh, uh, opposites attract, but in marriage, opposites attack. And so, um, stupid, y'all are going to remember it. And so... I'm real. And so, <laughs> what was I even saying? Who's offended here? I think, it's, I, think it's Ju I think it's Vanessa that's offended again. Sorry, Vanessa. And so, Junior can't ever have a serious conversation. He's always got to make a joke. He's always got to go the extra mile. My love language is not gifts. <laughs> My love language is time. And you got no time for me, Junior. And so we just continue to construct something 
ridiculous. I'm going to take one, one more from you. But let's see. Now let's go to Junior for a sec. Uh, hey, actually, uh, give both of those to Vanessa. Junior, step down in the front. Gosh, y'all are, y'all are doing great. Uh, I'm going to invite you up here more often. So, but it's just more unmet expectations, right? Because you know, because you know in my house, laundry was shared. It was a shared responsibility. Mom and dad both did laundry. But, you know, maybe in Vanessa's house, it just all fell to one person. And Junior is caught doing all the dishes. He's caught doing all the laundry for some reason. When Vanessa is in his house, the, the, the wife always did all this stuff. But it was always shared for her, and so she doesn't really think much about it. And so Junior's always just so kind and great, and he's always jumping on these dishes. And I love it. But for Junior, why doesn't she ever help? But he's not talking about it. And these offenses, one by one, by one, by one, they just, they just continue, okay? And so these, these offenses, they just continue <laughs> to add up. And it, again, it can be seemingly small. So thank you so much. You're, you're great back here. I'm glad no one can see you. Um, because maybe, again, it's, it's more small things. I wish she could drive. I wish she'd listen to me. I wish she would turn the GPS on. I wish she would just do things differently. You know, uh, Junior, though, Junior never takes our dogs for a walk. Vanessa thinks it's always me. It's always me cleaning up the poop in the yard. It's always me taking the dogs for a walk. I work. I work at a hospital. I'm saving people's lives. What's he doing? Answering phones. He has no idea the stress I'm under. And then I go to my group of friends who just reinforce toxic, you know, thoughts. Yeah, what does Junior do? Nothing. You work hard, Vanessa. Good for you. And then it just continues continue to spiral. You know, I wish, I wish he wasn't on his phone all the time. Don't you, Vanessa? Don't you wish Junior wasn't on his phone all the time? But you know, I just, I feel like I'm always harping on him. I feel like I can't tell him that all the time. So I just passively, aggressively will send him a text every now and then because I know he'll see it because he's always on his phone. Or I'll say, hey, why don't we watch something tonight? But I'll just never actually help the issue. I'll never actually bring it up. And then of course, what do we do? All of this just continues to spiral because we're not having a conversation, because we're refusing to talk about the offenses that we're feeling, because then, no matter what, eventually, we got to talk about finances. And, and maybe you're both savers. God bless you if you are. God be with you if you're both spenders, like me and Kelsey. Maybe I should have asked for permission before I said that. Uh, so, before we know it, we've got offense after offense after offense. And Junior, this don't look too good. And then we're we're wondering where'd the love go, where'd the friendship go? I feel like I don't even I don't even know who you are anymore. And Vanessa's just like. You haven't taken me to Chick-fil-A in three months. What happened to our date? Remember what the pastor said? Remember we need a date night? Remember? Remember these things? And so we, we just build these, these fences in our marriages, in our relationship to our friends, to people that we care about. It doesn't have to be marriage, but we just build these, these things and we think we're fine. We're fine. We're okay. Because on social media, it looks like we're killing it. But we couldn't be further apart, right? That's why it's so important that in a, especially in a new marriage, in any marriage, but especially in a new marriage, that you two, as we talked a lot about in premarital counseling, that you have to uproot these things and you have to have these discussions. You have to begin to do this. Vanessa, come come forward. Stay next to your husband here. It is so important to take these things, to not let these really get down into our hearts too much, to not let these flow into our lives all that much, but instead to uproot them, to have a hard conversation. This is, this is for you. To have a hard conversation 
about why you don't take me on dates anymore. Why you don't write me letters anymore. Why this? Why that? Why don't you do this for me? What happened here? What's going on here? It's important to have this conversation. Because Vanessa, you know what we're going to do? After we have this conversation, because forgiveness takes one person, reconciliation takes two people. And so when we get offended, reconcile. Need to reconcile. We need to have a hard conversation, a weird conversation, an awkward conversation. Because our souls need it. We reconcile. I can forgive anybody. I feel like so, means that we have dealt with it, we've dealt with the offense, and that we can drop it. If you weren't awake already, we can drop it though, because Vanessa, hold it out right there, because we have the greatest example in the world in the world of someone. Junior, hold with me of someone that. That dropped every offense of, of someone that, that could have pointed the finger and said, why don't you do this? Of someone that, that could have said, Give us, given us the list of every wrong we've ever done. We, we, we follow someone in our faith whose name is Jesus, who could have accused us, who could have said, you are not good enough, you are this, you are that, you are far from me, you are cast from me, but he didn't because instead he dropped every offense that he could have levied against us. We have this example in Christ. And I want to encourage you today that you example, the one that could hold it, no, to drop it. That every single thing against you in your life, he calls us to drop it, to, to, to drop these things. And so I don't know about you, but go ahead, Junior. Uh, I don't know about you, Vanessa. Go ahead. I mean, we're doing work. We're doing work. Uh, in the midst of this, I want to invite our worship team up. Come on, guys. Come on. Um, come on. Go ahead. Take it. Take it. Take it. Uh, we're going to drop. We're going to continue to drop. These because it is so important for your heart to take down these stupid fences. It is so important for your relationships, for your friendships, for your... just to take these things out and to drop them once for all and be at peace. Thank you all so much. You can go be seated. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we, we can't keep building these fences against other people and think that we're okay, we got it together, it's, it's fine. We, we, we can live this thing out. No. If you are offended, you will build fences. And the point is to, is to get them before they take root, is to get them before they go down deep. So I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what offenses you're still nursing and rehearsing. You're sitting on, and you think that person, these people, whatever it is, make peace. I told our lead team when we planted this church, I'm going to hurt you. No, probably not on purpose. Who knows? I'm going to offend you. And you're going to hurt me. And you're going to offend me. These things are going to happen. But we got this pesky value called peacemaking. Where we are going to choose to not leave meetings angry. Where we're going to choose to not leave interactions upset and offended. Where, where we're not going to leave things unsaid. And maybe, maybe for you it takes an hour. Like Nick gives me a call. But I've been, I have been a beneficiary of people who have come to make peace with me six months after the fact, and it needed to happen. Where in your life, who in your life, are you, are, are, are you building these offenses against? Who in your life do you need to go and be reconciled? Really, Pastor? I don't want to get into this whole thing again with them. Yes, go and be reconciled. Oh, but we've been to counseling for this already, and I don't want to get back into this. Like, again, we have to do this again. Yes, go and be reconciled. This says in Proverbs, a heart at peace is life to the body. I think we need some peace. I think we need some Oh, please stand. I want to close this in prayer as our team leads us in a, in a, a time of, of reflection and worship and ministry. But I think we need some peace today. So let's, will you pray with me right now? God, Father, in heaven, who sees all and knows all, sees our hearts and knows where we stand, knows where we're not. God, we just, we just come before you right now 
in sincere reflection and in, in, in all honesty. And we know we're not right with everybody. We know that, that we are at odds with some. And it is making our, our hearts a living hell. Like a garbage dump. What once was a garden in a healthy marriage is now just distant and stagnant and it's not what it once was. What was our relationship with our mom or dad has now just gone so stale because of, because of different beliefs, because of last year's elections, because of a, of a pandemic, because of things that seemed so big at the time we dug a fence for it. Or, or, or we got friends and we just feel like we are not on the same page like we once were. We've been pushed. There's something different. God, may we drop these offenses and be reconciled. But Lord, we, we struggle with this. But that's why we look to your example the one that dropped every offense. The fact that I have offended God is so terrifying. But your love poured out on that cross shows how much you love us and that we don't have to live in fear of, of torment and judgment. But we can embrace this grace you have for us. We can embrace your reconciliation. And then we can give that away to others. Pray for everyone here. Maybe we're far from you. We need to be reconciled to God. That comes through Christ. I pray we would come forward and ask for prayer in that. And that we would be reconciled to God. That we would know Jesus. Not just, not just believe in Jesus, but that we would follow Jesus. Or those of us who just feel at odds with other people in our lives. And we just feel like we live a life fenced off from everybody. God, whatever it is, may we be reconciled today as we sing of your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.